Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm Katie Helper. And I'm Aaron Mate. Hello, everybody. And a reminder to go to usefulidiots.substack.com or usefulidiots.locals.com to support the show and get bonus content. Bonus content, extended interviews, and Thursday Throwdown, your weekly dose of media madness where we react to media clips that are shameful, usually, sometimes entertaining, definitely worth watching. Uh, this is not a happy topic and it's not breaking news, but I did just want to say that I was very sorry to hear uh, about the death of Sinead O'Connor, who was a great singer and musician and activist. And I loved her album, The Lion and the Cobra. And I loved her album, Am I Not Your Girl, which was her covering kind of jazz standards and Hollywood standards, like uh, Be Witch Bothered and Bewildered or Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. Seems like she struggled a lot in life and it's just very unfortunate. And she was a great activist. She ripped up a picture of the Pope, as people probably know, on Saturday Night Live and got a lot of shit for it. In the victory of good over evil. Fight the real enemy. She was very brave, you know, starting with her her hairstyle choice. Yes. She, you know, shaved her head because she didn't want to be judged by her appearance. She wanted to be just judged by her her music. And her music was beautiful. And yeah, so she seems like a very brave person and it's a yeah. tragedy. It is, yeah. Something that's less well known about her activism is the fact that she, when she performed at the Grammys, she actually had public enemies logo on her shaved head. I don't know if she painted it or spray painted it, but it was on her shaved head. And she did that to protest the fact that the Grammys were giving out awards for rap music, but they were not airing that award ceremony. And she protested police brutality in her song, Black Boys on Mopeds and racism. And yeah, so major loss. Well, it's always sad to see someone go so young and uh you know rest in peace and rest in power to Sinead O'Connor yeah anyway hard to segue out of that because it's just such a sad story and such a bummer but uh do want to thank her for her contributions and should we just move on with the show and get to the four basic food groups let's do it all right let's do it so let's see we got Democrats suck and that's my bag this week so let's take a look at a uh, friend of the show we love him Anthony Blinken Here's what he had to say to the Australian foreign minister, Penny Wong, who was arguing for the end of the extradition of WikiLeaks founder, Julian Assange. Let's hear what she had to say, then let's hear what uh, Blinken had to say. So here's Penny Wong. We have made clear our view uh, that Mr. Assange's case has dragged on for too long and uh, our desire that it be brought to a conclusion. And we've said that publicly and you would anticipate that that reflects also the position we articulate in private. And here is the response of Anthony Blinken. The actions that uh, he is uh, alleged to have committed risked very serious harm to our national security, to the benefit of our adversaries and put named human sources at grave risk. So there you have it. You have Australians, uh, an Australian diplomat calling for the end of the extradition process of Julian Assange. And then you have Anthony Blinken, who uh, is, as Aaron points out, is uh, less diplomat, more more monger, but he refuses. And the grounds that he gives are that Julian Assange risked people's lives, put people's lives in, in danger. And what's interesting is that no one ever gives an example of anyone who died or was killed because of WikiLeaks. And, and you know that if they had any proof of that, they would be naming those people constantly all the time. Julian Assange did try to work with the State Department to redact names after a password was compromised and not by him. Right. And they rebuffed him. And you're right. They can't give an example of someone he endangered because he didn't endanger anybody. He did redact names, actually, when he had the opportunity to. And Lincoln there says he risked harm to national security. He didn't even say he caused harm to national security because he can't show an actual causal example. And no one ever asked him to explain how is it that your administration pardoned 
Chelsea Manning, who actually took all the documents that Assange published, but you won't drop this prosecution of Assange, who never stole anything. He just received it and published it. So there's already a precedent under Blinken's uh, previous administration, the Obama administration, which he served under, of actually pardoning Chelsea Manning, who you know, committed the underlying act here of taking the documents. Assange just received them. That's all he did. But yet, because they want to criminalize the act of embarrassing the U.S. government and having integrity, as Julian Assange does, being principled, they want to lock him away for life. It's so disgusting. And of course, if it was a crime to publish what he published, then they should also be locking up the publishers of The New York Times, um, The Washington Post, El País, the Guardian, Der Spiegel, because all these places also publish these documents. Yeah. And, you know, politically, the Biden administration could say this indictment happened under Trump. And exactly. We're always, we're always claiming that Trump is a threat to the rule of law, a threat to democracy. He wants and to a threat to a free press. Pretty, yeah. So perfect example. We're not going to follow the Trump precedent. We're going to drop this case. But, of course, they agree with Trump on things like this right. and it his took- neocon cabinet. So they're going to keep it going. Right. And they took Trump's side over Obama's side because Obama didn't free Julian Assange, but he was not uh, pursuing the indictment. That's right. That is right. Kind of put the brakes on it because Mm -hmm. of the so-called New York Times problem, which, as I just mentioned, is how can this be illegal for Julian Assange to publish it and not for the New York Times? All right. For Republicans suck. Let's turn to another fan favorite, Ron DeSantis, who says he wants to impose work requirements on people who get Medicaid, which is the national health program for low-income people. So Ron DeSantis was asked about this on the campaign trail, and this is what he said. The New Hampshire Republicans tried to pass a work requirement for Medicaid. You have to look for a job or do something productive. They could they struggle with the Democrats to get that passed. What should the federal government's stance be on that? So the federal government's stance should be for able-bodied adults there should be work requirements for all welfare programs. Uh, that works. The incentives need to be get, get to work. We've tried this in the past and it has worked. What happened was COVID came, they did the CARES Act, which was $2 trillion, and they were basically telling people not to work. And I think they maybe they thought that you could do that for a couple weeks and everything would be snapped out. But what happened is the CARES Act underwrote lengthy lockdowns in blue states. And so while Florida and Georgia and others were doing it, um, in fact, I had people come up to me, you know, did the other day saying like when they got to Florida during COVID, it was like a whole new world. They were so happy and everything. But it so we did well. But these other states and it created it just people dropped out of the workforce. I mean, we've had millions of people totally drop out to go from 98 percent of prime age males in the workforce to now 89 percent. That's the difference in terms of finding the worker. So the expectation needs to be any benefits must come uh, with work requirements. So it's actually worse than I described it. He wants to impose work requirements for all welfare programs, not just Medicaid. And I would love to see him try to justify his policy to a person who's on these programs, like say like a single mother with children struggling to make ends meet. Um, struggling to take care of uh, her family and try to explain to to them why it is that on top of all the troubles that they face as a low-income single person raising kids, they should also now be working in order to receive basic benefits for uh, their family. It's just like, it's. I can't believe that this policy of trying to force vulnerable people to work in order to receive the basics they need to live I can't believe how widely accepted that is. And I guess in this respect, we can't just say Republicans suck because, you know, Bill Clinton really, you know, pushed this along when he imposed work requirements for welfare recipients, too. But I don't know, in 2023, I just can't believe how easy it is to still advocate stuff like this without a sufficient challenge from the media and other politicians. And we know from, for instance, Barbara Ehrenreich's great book, Nickel and Dimes, where she basically went up undercover as a welfare recipient to see how hard it was. It's really impossible to uh, make this work with the work requirements. But yet it's still a very commonplace policy to advocate for Republicans and even for some Democrats, too. And it's yet one more reason why Republicans suck. 
Indeed. So for Isn't That Weird, we have a weird and kind of cute story coming from California and it involves a mischievous creature. Oh my gosh! Surfers trying to catch some waves off the coast of Santa Cruz, California, now competing with an unlikely adversary, a sea otter who's become infamous for biting boards and stealing surf. She's known as Otter 841, a five-year-old female who's been stalking surfers in this area for months. It was a cute encounter at first, which turned uh, aggressive real quick. Jun Young was surfing in the area when the seemingly harmless otter lunged at him. It made eye contact with me. It looked straight at me and my board. And before I was able to get far, it started attacking my surfboard. and was biting it off, just chewing it, tearing it apart. Parts of his board torn to shreds. <laughs> but was exactly Otter 841 shreds. born to be wild? Sea otters in their domain, in the ocean, they are top predators in their environment. While experts from Monterey Bay Aquarium say this confrontational behavior is abnormal for the species, this otter's mother also has a checkered past. Her mom was rescued and rehabilitated and re-released by the aquarium. And then her mom had to be taken out of the wild because this sea otter's mom was fed by people. And, and that's a real problem. But Otter 841 was born in captivity and raised with strict protocols, so she would not be too familiar with humans. Our team that, that interact up close with them wear big welding masks and black ponchos. We call it the Darth Vader outfit. And, and that's intended so they don't think human shape is friendly. So marine experts don't know what's causing her to act out, but warn swimmers to steer clear from these tiny, but mighty creatures. Well, I don't surf, but that's another reason for me personally not to try because uh, that sounds very frightening to come across a uh, surf-hating sea otter. Yeah, I mean, or surfboard-loving sea otter. True. I guess that's a, that's a positive way to look at it. Yeah, yeah. true. I didn't like the way they said, uh, I think there was some hyperbole in there. Uh, I don't like the way they said that the otter uh, tore up that uh, surfboard to, into shreds. There were two bite marks, maybe, one or two. And I just think that, you know, this is almost an isn't that terrible because the way that they are, I think, um, sensationalizing this otter. This otter is just a, a cute little otter trying to have fun, trying to ride a surfboard probably. And she's been traumatized by Darth Vader-like figures. That is probably why she's acting out. It's sea otter slander right there. Sea otter slander, yeah. yeah, and smearing. Yeah, well, maybe yeah. maybe we could file a, class, like a, a lawsuit on the otter's behalf. For yeah, misrepresentation. Yeah, I don't know if we have standing or surfing, mm. surfing standing, but we could try. Mm. But you know, the same media that whitewashes sharks demonizes otters, and we have mm. Shark Week this week, which is just terrible. Like I was trying to find a movie to watch on Netflix, and every movie was a shark movie, which is triggering as someone who hates sharks. But mm. the shark. You got copaganda and then you got sharkaganda and you do have the big shark lobby. <laughs> I mean, you, we don't have otter week or dolphin week. That's a great point. Where is otter or dolphin week? Yeah. Do they even have a it's day? A racer. No. It's a racer. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, that's my isn't that weird, which borders on terrible. And maybe even by saying isn't that weird, I'm contributing to the shaming, the otter shaming. So really, isn't that it's this is like an isn't that weird that Katie's being terrible on otters mm. when I'm mm. usually such a good ally. Wow. Just came full circle here. Continuing with uh, the theme of human interaction with mammals and animals. Let's go to this from Japan and check out this headline. Man who spent $20,000 to transform himself into border collie steps out for first ever walk in public. Apparently, this man spent $20,000 to turn himself into a dog. <laughs> and uh, let's see some pics. So here's some video footage of this man-turned dog. Looks very real to me. And for our audio audience, he is on all fours. He's in full costume. He's pawing at his pawing, yeah. bowl. He's eating out of a bowl. Looks very convincing. Yeah, he does, yeah. 
uh, the, face, the face is a little is is a little static though. I mean, he he. I think he needs more work in the face. You're right. It's yeah. not good face work. Maybe that would have cost like thirty thousand mm. dollars, and he only wants to spend twenty thousand on it. Yeah, yeah. But apparently, it was a big deal for him to come out of the costume and uh, just be in life as a human among other people. And uh, I salute him for trying that out. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of appropriation. It is appropriation, yeah. I mean, Species, yeah. Katie, you're, you're a big dog lover, so maybe you don't approve of this man's uh, life choices here. But yeah, I admire any commitment to any kind of bit, and he's really committed right. to this. One, so, it is you know. true. Yeah, it is true. Yeah, it is a big bit. It took him forty days apparently uh, to make the outfit. Forty days and forty nights. Well, yeah, job well right. done. Job well yeah. done. He he really pulled it off. So those are your four food groups. This week's guest is Anatole Levin. He is director of the Erasure Program at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, has many years of experience working as a journalist in South Asia, the former Soviet Union, and Eastern Europe, has covered the wars in Afghanistan, Chechnya, and the Southern Caucasus. And we're very excited to speak to him about the latest in the proxy war in Ukraine. And maybe we'll get into some other hot spots too, because... There's so much going on right now. So let's go to Anatole Lee. Anatole Levin, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. You have a piece at the Quincy Institute called uh, The Case for Ukraine's NATO Membership is the Zombie That Won't Die. Can you elaborate on what makes it a zombie that won't die? Well, what makes it a zombie uh, is that from the very beginning, NATO, including the United States, never had the slightest intention of actually defending Ukraine with NATO soldiers. I mean, I talked to NATO officials uh, after the, the, the initial semi-offer uh, in, um, in 2007, and they said we had no, there was absolutely no attempt to draw up any plans to defend Ukraine as a member of NATO. Um, so, I mean, this this whole strategy of bringing, well, strategy isn't really the right word, but of bringing Ukraine into, into NATO was always fundamentally empty. But having nailed themselves to this semi-promise, half-promise of NATO membership for Ukraine, and of course turned it into a a uh, great moral principle um, led by the United States, uh, leaders have never been able to bring themselves to abandon uh, that that stance, uh, even though, as I say, it was empty from the beginning. And you know, if they were prepared to abandon it, um, that could, in favour of a treaty of neutrality, that could have prevented the war, in my view, and could play a key part in bringing the war to an end. Uh, I, I mean, I really think our, our, our descendants will see this as insane, frankly, given that again and again and again, Biden and every other Western leader, even the Poles, uh, say that they are not going to send their own troops to defend Ukraine. Well, at that point, how can Ukraine be a member of NATO? And when it comes to the prospects of bringing this war to an end, you spent some time in Ukraine earlier this year. What were your big takeaways when it comes to the prospects of a negotiated peace and, and what might stand in the way? I mean, even before I went, but certainly after coming back, I'm profoundly pessimistic in the short to medium term about the possibility of an actual negotiated peace settlement in, in the sense of a you know, a treaty to end the war, because the two sides are simply far too far apart. Uh, and uh, I, after all, some of Zelensky's own advisors, his own advisors have said that if, uh, if Zelensky negotiates the loss of Ukrainian territory, he will be overthrown, he will have signed his political death warrant. Um, so I don't believe that that is possible. Uh, but uh, it does look at present as if the war is tending in the direction of a stalemate. And if a very bloody stalemate lasts long enough, um, with neither side making significant advances, then sooner or later, uh, I think the pressure for a, 
a stalemate to end the bloodshed uh, will become overwhelming. I can't say when that is. And there I have to say, uh, I did find divisions within the Ukrainian population. I found no sympathy for the Russian invasion or the Russian state or Putin. That has really been destroyed. It existed previously, but it has been destroyed or almost completely destroyed by the invasion. Uh, and uh, I have to say, I mean, a majority of people I talked to said that Ukraine should fight on indefinitely for complete victory and the recovery of all the territory it has lost since uh, 2014. Uh, but a very significant minority said, uh, no, I mean, in, in the last resort, if, you know, if this means just indefinite, unending bloodshed, we may have to compromise. Uh, however, it was very striking that not one person who said that was willing to say it on the record. Uh, when it came to, you know, fight on to the end, fight on for years or decades, people said that on the record. But in calling for or, or even admitting the possibility of a, a, a negotiated ceasefire, because, I mean, you know, we've heard a lot and quite rightly about the suppression of free speech in Russia, uh, but there is also tremendous pressure in Ukraine, uh, you know, simply to support not just the government line, but the hardest of lines uh, and not to question it. And, you know, given that um, the whole of the media is now under really strict state control, um, that is very much enforced in the public space. You write about the fact that um, Zelensky initially proposed uh, a treaty of neutrality. Now, we know, obviously, he's no longer doing that. And he ran kind of as a peace candidate. Was there any way for him to maintain his, that that position? Or was the far right just too powerful? Why did he shift from that position? It's not exactly clear what happened. Um, you know, the, uh, apparently Boris Johnson, my beloved then Prime Minister, did encourage Zelensky to take a hard line and even warned him or threatened yeah. him, you know, not to seek compromise. We don't know, by the way, that that that, that offer would have worked, um, but it might have. Uh, but I think the main thing was before the war. Now, Zelensky couldn't, you know, obviously found it very difficult to offer a treaty of neutrality himself at that stage, because he was under so much pressure from his own nationalists and hardliners. Uh, but, you know, Zelensky himself has said, or said back last year, uh, that uh, in the weeks before the war, uh, he went to all the to NATO and to all the leading NATO governments and asked, look, can you guarantee that within five years, Ukraine will be invited to join NATO. And they all said no. I mean, that, that's the other thing that makes this so morally shameful on the West's part. They all of them said no. Now, I have heard that at that point, uh, Zelensky said to President Macron, look, in that case, can you propose a treaty of neutrality, which I, you know, will then be able to accept? Uh, now, I cannot confirm this is the case. I obviously didn't hear it from Macron or from Zelensky. Um, and Macron said, oh, no, 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 you, you, this, this is something that has to come from Ukraine. And of course, Zelensky couldn't do it. But Macron could have done it, um, but basically didn't have the guts. Do you think it's um, arguable that Ukraine is actually farther away from NATO membership than it was when the pledge was first made back in 2008? Because back in 2008, there was at least some kind of roadmap as to what Ukraine might have to do to join NATO. Now, in this recent statement that we got from the NATO summit in Lithuania, all it said was that NATO will be in a position to invite Ukraine to NATO when all the allies agree and when conditions are met. But it doesn't say what those conditions are. At the very least, I would say Ukraine is just as far away as it was in, in 2008. Uh, because, uh, yes, I mean, the conditions are now entirely unclear, but it, it does seem, obviously, that a key condition is that the war uh, would ha have to come to an end. 
and not necessarily even with a ceasefire, but because a ceasefire, of course, can be you know broken and and war can be resumed. But I mean, what the war has demonstrated, and I suppose I'm very unwilling to say this, this is a kind of success for Russia, um, is that uh, you know NATO will not fight to defend Ukraine, uh, and uh, therefore. Uh, that uh, indeed, I mean, the idea of NATO membership is is empty, uh, and I, uh, of course, as well as um, U.S. Chinese tension grows and grows, uh, and also, of course, as domestic problems in the United States continue, it's not at all. And and by the way, as as you see more and more unhappiness within Europe and the growth of political divisions and radicalism here. Uh, it's by no means clear that you, you know, once once the sympathy for Ukraine, which was always, you know, a little bit, shall we say, rhetorical, dies down, it's not at all clear that you will have um, a consensus uh, of uh, NATO members ever giving NATO membership to Ukraine, whatever happens. So. Yeah, I, I I don't see um, I, I don't see any realistic prospect for for Ukraine to join NATO, um, and as for joining the European Union, uh, well that you know will take well a it will take a colossal you know effort of reform within Ukraine and of economic aid from the West, but also of course the longer the the war goes on, the more difficult that becomes because the greater the destruction uh, of Ukrainian infrastructure is, um, the more, you know, millions of Ukrainians who've moved to the West settle in the West and never go home. And therefore, the greater the bill uh, uh, that will come to the West for supporting Ukrainian reconstruction. Uh, And uh, I am not confident that Western countries will in fact be prepared to pay that bill indefinitely. What if the West did, if the West were committed to ending this war, what would they be doing? They would be uh, uh, aiming at a, at a ceasefire, but that would undoubtedly require both, conti- I mean, it would require intense pressure on Ukraine because a ceasefire, e- even if you know, accompanied by demilitarized zones and a United Nations peacekeeping presence, would require Ukraine, in effect, not formally, not legally, but, you know, like um, Cyprus, uh, at least provisionally, uh, to give up territory to Russia, which is deeply unacceptable to the present Ukrainian political establishment. Uh, It would require continued pressure on on Russia because there are Russian hardliners. It's not clear exactly where Putin stands, but certainly we know that there are Russian hardliners uh, who really want to continue this war to complete victory, who still believe that they can return to the agenda at the start of the war, which was the subjugation of the whole of Ukraine. Now, I mean, since the Prigozhin Wagner mutiny. I mean, Putin has cracked down on some of these people. Uh, so it's clear that he is not at present prepared, you know, to go down that road. But we don't actually know what terms for a ceasefire, you know, Putin would accept. So undoubtedly, you know, economic pressure on Russia and military aid to Ukraine would have to continue. Um, but it would have to be accompanied, obviously, by um uh, a willingness to relax at least some of this uh, pressure uh, in return for a for a ceasefire, and that would have to be made clear to the Russians. You've uh, previously advocated referendums in the contested areas of Ukraine, in Crimea, and in the Donbas. According to U.S. government-funded polls, it seems to me pretty clear that a majority of Crimeans would want to stay a part of Russia. Uh, in the Donbass, though, I'm curious what you think the outcome would be, especially now in the aftermath of the invasion. Um, and do you think such 
an outcome having these referendums is 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 a possibility do you think there's any state party that that would support it uh, there was a statement recently by a leading Russian propagandist actually advocating this um, and as a as a possible solution and responding to uh, the the peace proposals from Indonesia and from Brazil and elsewhere. I mean, it would be terribly difficult to arrange. I mean, uh, both because of of course tremendous opposition from the West and the Ukrainians. Of course, utter distrust, quite rightly, of any you know referenda held under Russian auspices. So it would have to be under United Nations auspices. Um, but also the fact that, of course, both uh, from the areas uh, captured by Russia since last year, but also from uh, the Eastern Donbas captured by Russia in 2014, which was very heavily bombarded by Ukraine. In the intervening years, There's been a tremendous movement of, of refugees. Um, so it's not clear exactly who you know who 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 is even there anymore to take part in a referendum. I um, spent ten days in in the Ukrainian held city of Zaporizhia, which is the capital of a province which has mostly been occupied by Russia um, and has been claimed by Russia, and where they held you know, quite fraudulent referenda in um, last year. Now, you know, uh, after a year of being bombarded by Russia, um, I found that the sympathy for Russia, which had previously existed on, in, in Zaporizhia, had, had evaporated. You can imagine. I mean, it's natural enough, no? Um, but I would imagine, I mean, I haven't been able to go back there because, of course, there are higher impossible legal restrictions apart from anything else. But, um, you know, the Eastern Donbass has been bombarded by Ukraine for eight years, since 2014. Um, and uh, more than 12,000 civilians have been killed, it seems, in these bombardments. Well, I would imagine that that has not inclined the people of the Eastern Donbass to wish to return to Ukraine. I have no proof of that, but it would seem logical. Uh, but of course, that does leave the question of the of, of the newly conquered territories by Russia. I don't suppose they would vote to stay in Russia, but who knows? Uh, of course, once again, I mean, so many of the the, the people who really feared Russian occupation left, um, and so the remaining population is both much smaller um, and uh, more elderly, possibly more pro-Russian. I don't know. The counter argument when it comes to those Eastern Ukrainians who might not want to live anymore uh, inside Ukraine is that, well, those are all just Russian proxies, that the the rebels in the East who've been fighting Ukraine for the last eight years, they're basically Russian, they're controlled by Russia, they're armed by Russia, they're directed by Russia. What do you make of that argument? Is there Does that erase some agency on the part of of these Eastern Ukrainians who've been fighting Ukraine for the last eight years? Or are they really just a a, a proxy of Russia? Well, they are a proxy. um, And of course, they've been armed by Russia and supported by Russian troops, naturally, since 2014. I mean, Russian troops in disguise. Uh, But, um, you know, my own travels in, in, in the Donbass previously did show that while prior to 2014, there was not majority support for independence from Ukraine. There was certainly deep distrust of Ukrainian nationalism, ethnic nationalism, uh, and desire for uh, for the autonomy of the Donbass, for full Donbass autonomy within Ukraine, which would, amongst other things, you know, protect the Russian language in Ukraine, um, give Ukraine, uh, give, uh, sorry, in the Donbass, give the Donbass control over its own economic fate and so forth, all of which were ruled out by the Ukrainian government. Well, that was basically the deal under the Minsk II agreement of 2015, uh, which the Ukrainian government simply refused to implement, although it had signed it. Whether Russia would have kept its word if they had signed it, we do not know. Um, But the point is the Ukrainians did refuse to take the first step. Uh, And as I say, I mean, to judge by my previous uh, researches, uh, autonomy was uh, a a generally favoured solution 
within the Eastern Donbass. So um, no, I mean these people have you know, have a opinions, a will, a local culture of their own. Uh, by the way, I mean not one historically speaking, I would say which was exa- which was Russian exactly. It was Soviet. That meant you know made it different from Russian nationalism, but it also made it very different indeed from the kind of West Ukrainian ethnic nationalism that now absolutely dominates in Ukraine. What is your sense of what happened with the Green Deal? Basically, all sides accuse the other of violating it. Russia says that it's Ukraine and the West fault, vice versa, when it comes to the Ukraine and the West versus Russia. Turkey is still trying to broker a resolution, but as of now, it is on pause and that Ukrainian grain is, is not leaving the country. What do you think happened there and is a solution possible? Well, it's clear that Russia expected or was hoping for a a, a relaxation, though only a, a, a very partial one, of some Western sanctions, uh, which were contributing to blocking Russian fertilizer exports and making it more difficult for countries to pay for Russian grain exports. Um, now, it said in the West, of course, that Russia was trying to do this, to use this as a sort of the thin end of the wedge to undermine Western sanctions in general. And there may well be a good deal of truth in that. Clearly, I mean, if if the West thought that these grain exports were really important, then it needed you know, to give Russia more incentives to continue with the agreement because, let's face it, you know, Russia is in the stronger position militarily. It is in a position to block these exports. I mean, it's possible as well, of course, that what what happened in the meantime is that uh, you have countries in Eastern Europe, including somewhat ironically, um, you know, Ukraine's supposedly strongest backer, Poland, Um, who are basically trying to block Ukrainian grain exports by land across their territory to Europe because they say, not without reason, that that these grain exports are not going to end up in Africa. They're going to end up in Europe and cut the bottom out from under Polish and Romanian and other farmers. So having observed that, Russia may well think, ah, you know, previously Ukraine had an alternative to exports by sea, um, not a complete one by any manner of means, but you know a partial one, which is exports by train um, to Western Europe. But if Europe itself is making big problems for that, well, that strengthens Russian, Russia's hand. Um, by the way, one must remark, of course, <laughs> once again, that after all this Polish um, rhetoric about support for Ukraine, when it comes to the interests of Polish farmers, who are part of the backbone of the political you know, support for the Polish nationalist government, uh, well, <laughs> support for Ukraine flies out of the window. And speaking of Poland, Putin recently came out and accused Poland of having some sort of plot, as I understand him correctly, to take over parts of, of Ukraine. Am I getting that right? And, and, and what do you make of all these accusations and, and the increased concerns about a a new front opening up uh, involving Poland and Belarus and Russia in this war? I mean, yes, I mean, Putin said that. I mean, this is above all part, of course, of uh, an old Russian uh, nationalist rhetoric about, you know, Polish ambitions to to restore the Polish empire over Ukraine and, and, and Belarus. Um, and of course, it's it's an attempt to also to appeal for Ukrainian historical sympathies against the Poles, because uh, historically speaking, of course, the Ukrainians have been just as anti-Polish or more as they have been anti, anti-Russian, anti if you go back into the past. Now, as far as I know, only the maddest uh, of Poles are actually advocating something like that. It's not Polish government policy. Some people have suggested that the po- the I mean Rasmussen, the former NATO Secretary General, who's now an advisor to Zelensky, I mean mostly just by as by way of trying to blackmail NATO, but has suggested that that a coalition of the willing led by the Poles might actually intervene directly in Ukraine. 
well, I mean, if if that happened, um, then two things are possible. One is that this would lead directly to world war because Russia would retaliate against NATO. But of course, it could be that the Russians would then say, ah, well, let's leave the Poles in occupation of, of um, Ukraine. And then, and then Ukraine becomes a, a Polish dependency. And let's see how the Ukrainians like that in the longer run. So that's one issue. The, the other issue, though, which I really do take uh, uh, very seriously, uh, is that Lukashenko, the, the dictator of, of Belarus, cannot live forever. Um, and I do not know whether Russia has a, a plan for how to replace him or how to manage a succession. But certainly, I mean, if there were another attempted revolution in Belarus and Lukashenko fell, then there would be every chance of the opening of a of a new a new front because the West would undoubtedly try to support the Belarusian opposition uh, or a you know an anti Russian successor regime, and then I think without any question at all Russia would simply occupy, maybe not all of Belarus, um, maybe Russia would in fact. Uh, leave a door open for the Poles to occupy part of Belarus, which because that would be such a, a huge propaganda gain for Russia. But certainly, I mean, it would be a, an, a, another appallingly dangerous moment. Uh, and I think that's something that, you know, th th this is where the complete breakdown of talks, you know, contacts, not just between Russia and America, but Russia and France, Russia and Germany, is so dangerous because it's extremely important, you know, to, to have lines of communication there uh, so that a future, uh, you know, crisis in Belarus can in fact be contained and does not lead or threaten to lead to a, to a world war. And you actually have a piece on the dangers of Russophobia. Um, do you think that Russophobia has also contributed to this kind of inability to grapple with uh, Russia as a rational actor? Oh, sure. Now, I mean, look, that said, uh, of course, I mean, the, the, the Russian government has committed endless crimes uh, and uh, as well as blunders, the biggest of all being the invasion of Ukraine. No question about that at all. Uh, but, you know, this hysterical hostility to, to, to Russia long predates not just the invasion of Ukraine, but, I, you know, when I wrote my, my first essay on Russophobia, um, I wrote that in 2002, when actually, you know, Putin was leaning over backwards to try to support America in the war on terror. Um and uh, to to avoid um, clashes with America. And from his point of view, but I must say many ordinary Russians as well, I mean, what Russia got for that was a whole succession of kicks in the teeth. Um, you know, action, the, the, you know, one agreement after another with Russia torn up by Washington. Uh, you know, Russia's interests and protests completely disregarded. So, yeah, I mean, and, and all of that driven by a constant rain of um, in many circles, I would say, yes, I mean, hatred of, of Russia from many different sources, you know, obviously the whole impact of the Cold War, the impact of ethnic lobbies with their own, uh, well, and their own good reasons to hate the Soviet Union, but not necessarily to hate Russia in that way, or at least if you, you know, if you go back to the Russian Empire, um, as I'm sure you would agree, you know, if you go back to the old European colonial empires, we are none of us innocent, right? Um, right. You know, and yet on the whole, I think we would say that constantly churning up, you know, hatreds is is not the best response to that. Yes, I mean Western journalists who, in every case, their default mode. Uh, was to take, you know, the anti-Russian line, and of course there was always enough Russian behaviour uh, to to seem to justify that. Um, but you know, I covered 
uh, Russia as a journalist, well, former Soviet Union, then Russia as a journalist on the ground for most of the 1990s. And, you know, it was profoundly disturbing um, to, to see the, the degree of bias among many of my journalistic colleagues. I was remembering um, when I first moved to Moscow from uh, the Baltic States and the Caucasus at the start of 93, and the then Russian foreign minister, Andrei Kozirev, I mean, the most pro-Western liberal foreign minister, not merely that Russia has ever had, but that it is possible to imagine Russia ever having. But as early as that, this didn't begin with Putin, you know, in his famous speech to the Munich Security Council in 2007. Kozirev, early in 93, wrote or stated that, look, if you go on humiliating Russia in this way, disregarding, you know, what Russians regard as their vital interest, taking advantage of every Russian weakness, you will get a backlash which will not only destroy you know, all the gains from the end of the Cold War, but will also uh, strengthen authoritarian nationalism in Russia and destroy, destroy the, dr the, the Russian dreams and hopes of Russian liberals like myself. All of which turned out to be totally correct, by the way. I always remember a, a British colleague, actually, but the, these were the days of, you know, faxes and printouts, uh, the Paleolithic era, um, was sending a, a transcript of this over to a colleague on the New York Times, and she scrawled in the margin, here are more of Kozarev's ravings. In other words, anyone who questions Western agendas, who questions Western goodwill in any way is literally mad. He's mad. He's crazy. No need to listen to him. That's just mad. You know? Do you have any fear that we're uh, heading towards World War Three? And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to usefulidiots.substack.com. What a great guest. So happy to be joined by Anatole Lieben, who has so much insight. And as I said, the Quincy Institute stands out now in D.C. as a prominent think tank, which is going against the grain and allowing perspectives that other think tanks just won't permit. To work at a think tank in D.C., you have to adopt the neocon line, and Quincy doesn't. And it's right. staffed by a bunch of you know, really expert people, as Anatole even exemplifies. Yeah, and they can't be dismissed as crazy ideologues or anything. They're just very impressive resumes. Absolutely. Yeah. And Anatole Lieben is lucky because he's happens to be extremely smart, but then you put on top of that the English accent and it's just like, forget about it. <laughs> Unbelievable, powerfully speak, unbelievably powerful speaker. There is something very persuasive about that. Obviously very educated English accent that he right. has. It's uh yes, it's powerful. Now he could, he could speak like my uncle from the Bronx and we'd still be blown away by what he has to say. It just makes it next level. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, as always, usefulidiots.substack.com or usefulidiots.locals.com to get bonus content, including the extended version of this interview. Where we get into whether or not World War III is around the corner. That's a good cliffhanger. Yeah. Stay tuned. See you next week. Hopefully. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Hello. Thank you so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For full episodes and extended interviews, please subscribe at usefulidiots.substack.com. You can subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash usefulidiots for clips, live streams, and full episodes. Also, subscribe to us wherever you find your podcast. Follow us on Twitter at usefulidiotpod and use the hashtag usefulidiotspod. Join us Mondays at 10 a.m. for the Useful Idiots Monday Morning Show, where we discuss the Sunday morning news shows so you don't have to watch them. <laughs>